Hello everyone, this is Faith at Faith in Books. How are you doing? I want to thank everyone who responded to my video that I made last Saturday, I think, about um, the passing of Jennifer Brooks. I have never gotten such a response before. I'm a very small channel and um, it, I was just amazed at the response. Um, I read every comment. I really appreciated everyone's response. <clears throat> um, we even got a comment by Jennifer's pastor who uh, told us about uh, the memorial service for her, which was yesterday. And if you go to the Rolling Roads Baptist Church YouTube channel, which I will link below, they had a slideshow of photos of Jennifer from, you know, from when she was a baby to, to most recently. So, and also he said that they were going to uh, post a recording of the memorial service itself. So, uh, so I will link that below. But I was just overwhelmed by the response. And I think that maybe we just needed to grieve together and to acknowledge the loss that, that the BookTube community had experienced. I've seen other people respond as well. I saw um, Emma at the Bookish Princess who, when she did her Fabregency, um announcement, she talked about how Jennifer had helped with that for the past two years. So she had gotten to know her that way. Um, Kate Howe mentioned her in a video she made about how much, you know, what, what a great loss it is to us, her death. Um, and then um, I saw several other people acknowledging, and I can't remember the name of one of them, but she was going to do an American history reading project and she was dedicating it to um, to Jenny, uh, because Jennifer had inspired her to read certain books. And, um, last night I saw one by Mariana Moss Books, and that's a really, I'll link, I'll link to that too. That's a wonderful tribute to Jenny. And I know that Christy Lewis and Tiffany at, um, A Beautiful Minutia, I think that's right, are going to do a, um, a Jenny, we love Jenny, uh, readathon, and that is coming up. They announced that they were working on it, um, so hopefully it'll, the announcement will come out in a few days. Um, so that's something that's going on. Um, there was even a woman who, who named, who started her a new booktube channel, and I forget her name. Sorry, uh, but she called it the Unhinged Woman Book Club after uh, Jenny's terminology for that. Um, and so there's just been an outpouring on BookTube. Uh, we're really going to miss Jenny. So thank you so much. Uh, I've got all these new subscribers, so thank you for subscribing. Um, and, you know, I my prayers go out to uh, Jennifer's family, especially to her mother. Um, and I think that, you know, Jennifer would just want us to continue on, uh, with our joy of reading and sharing it with each other. And so that's what I plan to do right now. I'm going to do a reading update and what I'm currently reading, what I plan to read through the end of January. So let me see, I put my books in order here. Let me get a drink of water. Hmm. It's so dry out, it's very cold and snowy out, which is why I'm not sitting in my car, which is my favorite place to record videos. Um, so anyway, the books that I've read in January so far, so these are these I didn't start in January, but I finished in January, the first two anyway. Um, this one is The Pushcart War by Jean Merrill. I started reading this to my eight-year-old grandson a couple of months ago at least, we read it off and on. I, I usually just read to him for a few minutes over breakfast while he's getting ready for school. Um, but we had a lot of disruptions with a lot of illnesses and his and mine. 
and then we had, you know, Thanksgiving holiday and the Christmas holidays. And so we didn't finish this until a few days into January. This was a five star read. Um, we didn't start out with this edition. We had an old paperback. I think it was Scholastic or Puffin or something, but the pages were starting to come unglued. It was just a paperback. The, the, the pages had really yellowed too. But, um, so I got a new copy, um, a new edition. This is from New York uh, Review Books. They have the best curated collection of backlisted children's books. I, I just want to get every one. I get so acquisitive when I get on their website. I mean, I love I love their website. I'd never known about it until BookTube. But New York Review Books are great. And they have this wonderful binding, this sort of signature red binding um, for some of their children's classics that they've reprinted. And when I saw that they had this one, I was like, I got to get it. So I did. Anyway, this is, um, this is a middle grade book, and it's about a fictional war between the pushcart vendors and the truck drivers of New York City. And it's set in, like, I think it came out in the, 80, in the 80s, but I think it's sort of set in maybe the New York of the 50s or 60s, maybe. Oh, no, 1964 is when it came out. Okay, I did not realize that. Um, so maybe it is like the 50s. Um, and... It's just wonderful because it's it's told very economically, but um, there's a real sense of humor. And it's the type of book that the children get the storyline, but if you're an adult reading it, you get all the satire that's going on because it's really poking fun at government and big business and how it influences government and how the press influences everything, all these aspects of society, how they interact, but it's told in a very humorous way. It's very clever. I really, really enjoyed it. I think it would be great to use in a school, like my, my uh, daughter teaches seventh grade English in the public schools, but they do American history in seventh grade and then civics in eighth, I believe. But it would be a nice civics, like you could you could do a writing um, lesson on how to write better, you know, like using her style of writing, but then you could also analyze the book about, um, the interaction of business and government and media. So, um, so you could do that in a civics class. Anyway, I highly recommend this book. I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm so glad I got it in this nice, uh, New York review books edition. So then the next book I finished, I started this right after Christmas because I got the whole set of Agatha Christie Miss Marple mysteries. So there are 12 of them. And this is the first one, The Murder at the Vicarage. And I had actually read this before, but I never remember how mysteries end. I never remember the punchline of a joke and I never remember how mysteries end. So jokes are always funny and mysteries are always interesting to me. So that's the blessing of having a bad memory. But this book was... I really liked her writing style. I like Agatha Christie a lot, but some of her books are maybe three star and some of them are closer to five star. Like for me, three star is, it was worth finishing. And four star is I would recommend it to other people. And five star is I just thought it was brilliant. So this is probably four, four and a half stars. I just liked the way she told the story. I thought she was very deft. Um, again, she was kind of economical. She tells it from the first person perspective of the vicar. And I loved his relationship with his wife. And I loved meeting all the characters in the village. And I loved Miss Marple. So I thought it was a good story. I really, really enjoyed it. Then the next book I read was um, a Nancy Drew book. And I'm participating in Mitzi at Mitzi Reads and Writes, Nancy, Let's Read Nancy project and she has a Voxer group going and this was the book for January. Uh, we were supposed to initially read it in December and I did start it in December but then people were too busy with Christmas and everything so they moved it to January. So I put it down I picked it back up and um, I enjoyed it. Now I was really excited to get this copy because this is a reprint of 
if uh, Nancy drew from the 30s. So you can see she's wearing more 30s. Everyone's wearing more 30s garb. Um, yeah, here's another. You see that? Um, the more commonly known ones are the ones that were revamped or re redone, um, I think, in 1959 or in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and those are the more common ones. But, but these were the originals. And, well, this isn't an original. This is a reprint. So they decided at some point to reprint all the, the, the ones from the 1930s. And that's what this is. I was really excited to get it. Um, and... Um, and it was a good story. I mean, Nancy Drew writing is bad. Uh, there's too many L-Y adverbs all the time stuck in there. And you feel like somebody's writing, you know, with the thesaurus right next to them because um, it's a little clunky. But um, I enjoyed the story. However, it's a completely different story. I mean, this is about her chasing diamond thieves and um, there's the lilac in is involved. But, uh, so I think they kept those two very basic elements, but in the revamped version, the plot is completely different. So everybody was talking about this book and I could not understand what they were talking about because I read a completely different book. So somebody else in the group actually has collected all these Nancy Drew books. So she read them side by side. She had this one as well as the, the later version, but I didn't, and I'm not gonna go get one right now. So, um, so anyway, so I enjoyed reading it, but I kind of missed out on the discussion part. So so I made sure that the next book that I got, what did I do with that book? I think it's upstairs. Um, I forget something. It's got the word, the mystery at something ranch, shadow ranch or something. That's for next month. I made sure that I got the later uh, edition so that I could read along with other people. And then, so that's uh, that was three books so far. And then on the, my Kindle... I read Frost in May by Antonia White, or maybe it's Antonia White. I never know how to say that name. Um, but she, um, I think that it said that this was the first uh, writer uh, republished by Virago Press. Um, this was the very first one. Um, so I read this for Shondi Standfast's um, Faded Pages book club. And this came out, I think, also in the 30s, 33 or something. Anyway, it was wonderful. It was another five-star read. Um, it is the story of a young girl whose father has converted to Catholicism. And so she did too. And she's about nine or 10. And she gets sent to this Catholic boarding school, um, The Five Wounds. Um, and... Um, I, I was shocked at how much Catholicism was in it, like how much actual theology. Um, and that that would appeal to people and the Virago Press would choose to reprint this. It just kind of boggled my mind. So, you know, she's she's really embraced her faith and she's really living it out in this boarding school. But the problem is that the nuns there are just oppressive. They are so concerned with these girls sinning that they are invasive and really abusive, really. We would see it as abusive today. Um, you know, the girls' letters home are censored. Um, they're not allowed to form deep friendships with other girls, though of course they do. And I can see why you would want to prevent, because girls can be very clicky, you know, and that is hurtful. So I could see where you, but, but they didn't go about it the right way. They did it in a very emotionally damaging way. And so Nanda, who is the main character, her name's Fernanda, but they call her Nanda. She's a very intelligent, passionate, um, astute young lady. And, you know, she just feels this suffocating atmosphere. It's very, very, um, she rebels against it. E even as intellectually, she's accepted the faith and she... She, she struggles with scrupulosity. So the two things that are going wrong here with this boarding school is one, that the, um, the nuns are very Jansenistic, or Jansenism is a heresy where you see the body as dirty, like it's, it's evil. And so there's a lot of prudishness and just going way too far um, 
uh, when it comes to how to treat the body. Um, you know, a real fear of, of uh, sexuality. And, um, and the other thing that's going on is this scrupulosity, which is a sin because it means that you don't trust God's mercy. You're so worried about misstepping and accidentally sinning, which you can't even do, right? You sin when you deliberately turn away from God or when you ought to have known better, but you didn't do the right thing. And of course, you can always ask for forgiveness because God is merciful. But, um, but scrupulosity is when you really think it's you. You have to be perfect. And so you're constantly worried about your imperfections. And it's like life is a land full of landmines and you never know where to step. You're so nervous about everything. And that is a sin because you're not trusting in God's mercy. You're not trusting in his love. And, um, and so it's something that people have to, some people are really prone to it. And Nanda is, she's that type of person or she's overly scrupulous. And the nuns are too, and they really encourage that. They, they really, what really got me was their arrogance. They really thought that their judgment was perfect and that everything they did was the right thing to do in order to prevent these girls from sinning. And uh, it was just, it was just way over the top. So eventually she rebels. Now this is the first of four books that she wrote that are fictionalized auto biographies, not autobiography for her, for, for Antonia White. So I want to read the next three because the thing about the book is you get sucked into the, the atmosphere right away. Like you're just, I so identified with Nanda right away that it's just written beautifully. So there's three more books. And then later on in her life, Antonia White or Antonia White, uh, reverted back to Catholicism. So she wrote a straight up memoir about that experience called, oh, I ordered it from Thrift Books. Uh, it's called The Hound and the Falcon. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, so I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that. And I also want to read the next three books in this quartet because it was really, really good. So I'm very glad that I read that. So those are the books that I finished so far. Then, um, I tried to read this book, The uh, the Librarian Spy. This woman, Madeline Martin, she wrote The Last Bookshop in London, which I've heard booktubers talk about, but I can't remember what they said. <laughs> but anyway, I think the circumstances under which I was reading this, you know, made it hard. And so I was, my husband had to have his hip replaced and he had, it was this one Tuesday. We've had so much snow. We were really nervous about getting there on time and how the roads would be. So we went early. We got there on plenty of time. And then I wound up just waiting hours and hours and hours. He did really well. He's recovering miraculously. It's wonderful. But um, I t this was the book that I brought with me. And the waiting room was like this big cavernous hallway. And it was so noisy. And I sat there for hours trying to read this book. And I only got to page 62. Uh, I could barely concentrate on it. It was it was like, it just felt like hard work to read it. And I didn't, <laughs> I wound up just playing solitaire uh, for hours. Uh, not solitaire, Scrabble. You know, scra playing Scrabble with myself on the phone. Uh, and then trying to read this book, like I would alternate. Anyway, so I think that really tainted it for me, but it just wasn't grabbing me, even though it should. It sounds like a really interesting plot, but the writing was kind of flat. And it's what my my mother used to call good housekeeping writing, <laughs> good housekeeping magazine writing, where it's just not the highest level of writing. And I it just didn't it just didn't absorb me. Like I just couldn't get absorbed into the story even though it sounded like it could be an interesting story. So I don't know. Have you read The Librarian Spy? What did you think of it? Um, I don't know if I'd just put this aside and try it again or if I should unhaul it. Right now, though, it's just, I don't, I'm just, it's not appealing to me at all. So, yeah, so that was a sort of a, it's not really a DNF. It's sort of a non-starter kind of book. And then I decided, well, let me see. I'll tell you what, um, 
I'm looking at my stacks here to see where I am. Um, okay, so that's when I, well, I did what I finished, one that I didn't finish, and then I'll tell you what I'm currently reading, and I better hurry up because it's getting long. So, so I needed a book to read, so I picked up Rachel Ray by Anthony Trollope. Now this is, this was my mother's book, and I vaguely remember her saying how much she enjoyed this one, but I got a bunch of my mother's Anthony Trollope's on my shelf now. I'm holding it for my whole family. Um, but they had been missing for almost 12 years. And then my sister this past summer was cleaning out her basement and she found a box full of her, of my mother's Anthony Trollope collection. So I get to keep it on my shelf. Uh, and I want to read five Anthony Trollope's from my mother's collection this year. That was something that I planned to do for 2024. So this is the first one that I'm doing. It's Rachel Ray. And right away I got, I got into it, like from the first sentence. It's just quintessential Anthony Trollope. He is one of my favorite Victorian authors. This is very much in the Barchester um, Towers mode of, of a novel. It's like, I would put it over with Barchester rather than Palliser. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really delighted by it. I really like it. So I'm excited that I have that. And I hope to finish it by the end of January, right? I have about 10 days. Um, I'm also reading George Eliot's uh, Daniel Deronda. I have been, ever since I joined BookTube, I, I try to read a George Eliot every January because when it's so gray and cold out, that's when I want to read a chunker, uh, a nice Victorian novel. And so I've read my first January, I read, what did I read that first January? Was it Rama, Ramala? I think, yeah, I think everybody was doing a group read of Ramala. Um, so I read that. And then the next one I read Felix Holt. And then the next uh, January, last January, I reread Middlemarch. And now I'm reading Daniel Deronda. I didn't really know the story very well. I did see bits and pieces of the BBC series many years ago, but not very much of it, just bits and pieces. Um, so I had a vague idea of what it might be about, but not really. Um, I'm enjoying it. I'm actually reading it on my Kindle, but then I'm keeping track with this because I love George Eliot so much. Anthony Trollope and George Eliot are my favorite Victorian authors. Um, so I want to collect all their books. So I bought this, but I'm actually reading it on the Kindle. But I'm this far, so I'm more than halfway. It, I had trouble warming up to this because I did not like the main character very much. But she's really developing now. And Daniel Deronda is becoming more of a focal point. <coughs> it's very interesting. It's, it's one of its themes is exploring anti-Semitism in the Victorian age. So... That's really interesting. And it's exploring a lot of things. It's exploring um, relationships, family relationships, and kind of who are you if if you don't have a typical family. Um, yeah, I can't, I'm not expressing myself well. But anyway, it's, a, it's very interesting. I do hope to finish it also by the end of January. We'll see if that can happen. Then let's see what else am I reading. I, oh, I'm listening on audio. I had to write a little note to myself. I'm listening on audio to SPQR, uh, A History of Ancient Rome by Mary Beard. And I think I have about 10 hours left in the book. I don't even know how many hours it was. Maybe I'm a third through, something like that. But I'm listening to it in bits and pieces. And I'm, I'm prepared to listen to it all the way till the end of February. I'm going to try and finish it by then. Um, so I don't do audiobooks very fast because I don't use earphones and I don't, I only have dedicated time to listen that are, you know, 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there. So, um, so it takes me a while to get through them. Um, but I'm enjoying it. Um, it's, you know, I have, I know some Roman history. I've forgotten a lot of it, but, you know, recognizing recognize names or like the names of battles or whatever but um this is nice that it's putting everything in context she starts with Romulus and Remus you know the the founding legend and she's gone through the 
Seven Kings, and now we're in kind of the late Republic and the, the literary flourishing that happened at that time. So she's mentioning a lot of familiar names. One thing I don't like, or I find it mildly irritating is she's kind of, I feel like she's kind of condescending to like, especially Roman historians like Livy and I don't know, Cicero and, and different. Um, she sort of wants to sort of deflate or, 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 you know, excuse their inaccuracies. Cause I guess historians now consider themselves more science fiction scientific rather than back then when they wrote to sort of promote patriotism or whatever and so she's kind of there's a little bit of condescension there that I find mildly irritating but overall I'm enjoying it I'm also reading in this beat up bible that I've had since um, college I'm reading the Acts of the Apostles which of course is set in Roman times it was written in Roman times and um, I only I just finished chapter 26 and there's only two more chapters. So I'm almost done with this. I'm almost done with uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and then after I finish the Acts of the Apostles, I'm going to go back to my default theology read, which is The Lord by Romano Guardini, um, who was a, an Italian 20th century theologian. And this, I like to read theology in the morning after I pray. And so when I'm not reading something else, I'll be reading this. I'm hoping to finish this book by the end of 2024. And then two more things to talk, talk about. Um, I've been reading Robert Burns. He is my poet for the month. And this has hundreds of poems in it. So I went to the section called Ballads and Songs, and that's what I've been reading. And I've read about nine of them. and. I made a good choice because these are really cozy to read on gloomy January days. They really are uplifting. They're so romantic and lyrical and quaint. I'm really enjoying them. So, so yeah, I like my Bobby Burns. And then um, I looked up and saw that um, it's International Holocaust Remembrance Day on January 27th. I don't know why it is on that particular day. So I decided that this coming week on, on the 27th, I'm going to start reading Night by Eli Weissel. I'm not sure how you say that. Um, and um, this is part of my Read 24 books from my shelf in 24. So that was The Librarian Spy too, but I I don't feel like I'm going to get that read, but I would like to read this one. This is very short. It's just over 100 pages. You can see it's an old student's copy. I got it for just, I don't know, 50 cents or a dollar or something. But um, I've heard about it forever, and I've never read it. So I think I'm going to try and read it on the 27th. So hopefully I can read this in addition to the uh, Trollope and the Elliot. And then I also did start another book with my grandson, and this was also from the New York Review Books, and it is The Lost Island by Eilis Dillon, and he loves it because his name is Dillon, but spelled differently, um, Eilis Dillon. And this is so, this promises to be great. It's so quaint. It's set in Ireland. Um, I think in the 1920s and it's just really charming and quaint and it's about a young boy who I know he's going to go on a quest to find his father but we're finding out about the mystery of his father's disappearance so really really charming they they I really love those New York review books especially the children's section so Yes, so that is all that I'm reading. Oh my gosh, I talked for a super long time. I'm so sorry. Uh, if you stayed to the end, thank you. Um, and so, um, I don't know, I wish you the best. Um, and, um, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll post whenever I find out more things that are going on about Jenny, I will um, post them. And I'll put all the links to things in the show notes below. And so happy reading.